it was kind of ironic when we were uh, coming up with the name for this, we thought the uh, world without walls would be kind of ironic. Um, several years ago, we had uh, introduced the concept that uh, identity is the new perimeter because uh, we saw network perimeters disappearing. And um, actually last year we were talking with Forrester and they, they uh, commented how uh, several of our competitors have stolen that uh, tagline and are using it today. So I just thought we could re-spin it to, or, to or something that's more in the headlines. So, um, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that's in the news is, is this whole concept of data breaches. And, uh, okay, good, I don't need to be there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's ironic that it's, it's growing and growing. And, it, and the question is, is it growing because we're requiring people to report them more frequently? Or is it growing because it's, it's, it is literally growing? Um, one thing is for certain, the amount of records and the amount of credentials and the cost of data breaches is definitely uh, escalating. Um, the scope of it, I mean, we here in the US kind of focus ourselves very much internally most of the time. But you know, last year, 700 million people worldwide were impacted by, uh, by cybersecurity incidents and breaches. So um, it's not just a US uh, problem. It is definitely a global problem. Um, and the whole concept of data breaches is really comes down to the data. And uh, you know, Bill and I were talking about this earlier. Was uh, there's two things, and or there's three things that I'd, I'd like to you know bring up at least for, for, for data. I mean, I know um, you know years and years ago. God, this is but like 20 years. I worked uh, with the Navy on uh, at the EA21 uh, program office on um, the paperless initiative. You know, and we talked that. You know, those initiatives, you know, while they were meant to save money, basically increased the accessibility of data. We were starting to move data around electronically everywhere. And every time we start to move data around electronically, we're creating more and more vulnerability points, more and more ways in which people can steal data. Um, and, and, and if you look at the commercial side, you know, these massive organizations are, are accumulating massive amounts of data. And um, that's where uh, people will go. I mean, obviously, there's the, there's the old uh, adage, um, this bank robber was asked, why do I rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. So that's where people are stealing, is where we're accumulating all of this data. Um, the other thing about the data is, and this is more, I think, appropriate, because um, you know, no matter what organization we go to, whether it be a commercial organization or you know, a, a federal agency or even a local uh, federal government, they rank their data based on their mission. Um, you know, and, but they have different types of data that they're storing. Uh, well, the data that is most important for their mission um, may not necessarily be the data that someone's trying to steal. You know, data that they look at as saying that it's not quite a part of our core mission may be the number one source of data that that hacker wants. Um, so it's like all data has to be, I don't want to say treated equally, but we just can't ignore things that aren't core or critical to the mission just because we don't put a value on it that the external world does. You know, any data that can be turned into currency is wanted. And, and if you have enough, uh, a large enough source of that data in your agency, uh, someone's going to want it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, so. What we really look at when we're looking at data is we're looking at um, where are we storing this data? You know, we, we definitely have more places. Who's accessing this data and how are they accessing it? Because every one of these represents a potential point of attack and a potential point of vulnerability. Um, now, this, this quote came from Forrester. If you guys have seen the Forrester report, 80% uh, of data breaches are uh, involved privileged credentials. So naturally, that's where we start our point of you know, securing the data. Um, and we look at privilege access management. And there was just uh, the CMD program a couple, you know, last year and the year before, which was requiring this. And um, you know, it makes perfect sense. Because if you're going to steal data, you know, and, the, and the analogy I like to use is, I'm a teller at a bank. I handle money coming in. I can steal money but I can only steal a small percentage of it. But if I'm the bank manager and I have the keys to the vault, I can steal all of it. 
So why do people want to steal these credentials and, and get access to privileged accounts? Because they have the greatest capacity to steal all of the data. Um, but, and this I think was mentioned in a, a couple of the earlier sessions, um, you know, just because we're protecting the, the, the keys and we're protecting access to these privileged accounts, what if the person that is the privileged user gets compromised? Whether they suddenly decide, you know what, today I don't want to be a good person anymore. Uh, I didn't get my raise or I didn't get a, a bonus or I just want to retire early and I'm going to start doing malicious things. Or somebody's just compromised their account. Well, most access management systems are basically black and white. If they, if they think you are the user that you say you are, they're going to give you that access that that person would have. So a malicious user can exploit all the access that that person had. Um, and this is where automation has come into play, where analytics comes into play. Um, and we call this solution threat analytics. You may know it also as user behavior analytics. Um, but what this does is it basically models the, the uh, privileged user's behavior and creates a pattern of usage. And so if I suddenly decide to go rogue, I'm going to do things that I don't normally do. You know, I don't normally download data in, onto USB drives as part of my normal job function. But if, if I'm going to be a rogue and I'm going to suddenly start stealing data, that's what I'm going to do. If I'm a malicious user, I'm not going to behave like the regular user. I'm not logging into his account to do his job for him. I'm logging into the account to try and exploit it, and which means I'm going to have different behavior patterns. Um, and where the automation comes in is you don't want to just have alerts. You know, um, For those of you that are not in the, in the security realm, you know, there's usually not a lot of us on the security team. And you know, being overwhelmed with, with alerts is not helpful to us. You know, um, Having some, a system come in and to look at what's being done and to make some analysis like they, just the previous session we talked about is, is separating that noise. You know, maybe some of this uh, threat is OK, and we can just say, let's just record that. Or maybe it's, it's so extreme that we say, let's stop it. Um, but, I, but if I wait till, you know, get it, and I, by the time I get it and to react, you know, let's say, Data breaches take a few minutes once somebody gets in. They steal the data and they're gone. By the time I am alerted as a human, it's too late. You know, I might, I might be able to go in and see how I got hacked, but you know, it's already, the damage is done. Um, that's where analytics is, is coming into play. And you're starting to see that in, across the board in terms of uh, security solutions is, is doing what they mentioned earlier, is mention, uh, separating the noise. Um, so. Let's look at beyond privileged users. Um, we say business users here. This is usually anyone that's an internal user. It could be a contractor. It could be um, a, a business partner. It's basically anyone that you consider like an internal user. Um, and internal users are all privileged users or internal users in general. Um, and the, way, and the, the example I use here is, uh, you know, if you look at a restaurant and you look at a waiter or waitress, let's say it's a big chain. They may not consider that waiter or waitress a privileged user. But the moment I give them my credit card, they are holding PCI data. They have privileged access to confidential data. So that's the same thing in our organizations. As soon as somebody checks out a privileged account or starts to do something that is, has elevated privileges, they go from being a regular user to a privileged user. Um, but how do we know when that happens? I mean, historically, privileged users were people that had root access, system admin access. That's not necessarily the case today. There's a lot of business users that have roles that make them very privileged. Um, and so the systems that have historically, and again, we're not talking, these are not brand new systems, are identity and access management solutions. Access management solutions, you may know these of single sign-on solutions. They were you know, 20 years ago, everyone started deploying these to make one password, you know, one password to get access to everything. Uh, in the federal world and in, in, in the Department of Defense, it's like a, one PIV card, one CAC card uh, to get access to everything. <clears throat> That's great. They also provide other la la layers of security be besides just automation. They can put another layer of security over access to, to different resources. 
they can also, in, in regards to privilege access, um, now this is, this is, this is okay, I'm going to be sarcastic here. Um, what happens if you actually outsourced IT operations to external contractors and service providers? That never happens in the federal government at all. Um, but we, had, I, we have a lot of customers, especially, it's, it's ironic, in the uh, Middle East and in Asia Pacific, that are looking at solutions like this just to get those users into the PAM solution, into privilege access management. They want to pr control that access you know, using either federation or some sort of controls just to protect access to get into the, the PAM solution. Um, and then identity management and governance uh, provisioning solutions. You know? Again, another solution that was put into place by a lot of people to automate, you know, and, and if, if I'm being honest, a lot of commercial enterprises use this solution to reduce headcount. They had 10, 20 people that were just doing manually account management and they wanted to get rid of them, so they looked at these types of solutions. Um, but where these solutions are coming into play more is governance, you know. Let's take PAM solutions. PAM solutions take a while to deploy. You know, you, you look at a, a set of, uh, 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 servers and accounts that you, you deploy for, and then a few months later you deploy for another set, and then another set, and then another set. Um, but nobody ever actually goes back and says, hey, six months ago you needed access to these servers. Do you still need that access? Um, that's where governance is starting to, to play a, a more critical role, is going back and looking at, you know, do I really have over-accessed people uh, in my environment, both on the, the normal users and also my privileged users? <laughs> And finally, one that I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on because, uh, I, in my opinion, I think the, the federal government's already kind of um, addressed this one, is uh, stolen credentials. You know, everyone's moving to two-factor, multi-factor credentials to, to reduce passwords, which are so easily stolen. Um, and then, you know, obviously leveraging those not only for regular access, but also for privilege access as well. Um, but the even in this area, we're starting to see more analytics come into play in terms of looking at where users are coming from, what devices they're using, and, and factoring that into so it's not just the PIV card. It's also the analytics uh, associated with that. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who's now going to take the security and look at how do we interface this security beyond um, just this to devices and applications. You want that? Yep, I do. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. So what Rob just talked about is how do you protect your backend system? How do you protect your data? How do you make sure that only the right person can get access to that data for the right amount of time? But let's face it, um, everything that he talked about is really designed around a browser front end. And real world, how many of you use a browser at your desktop to do your work? A few of you. Now, how many of you carry one of these guys? I suspect most of you. And how many of you use the browser on this device to do your government work? Nobody. In fact, I saw a couple of disgusted looks very quickly. Um, and rightfully so. Browsers are very important. But real world, over the last 11 years, the application economy has forced public and private sector to modernize their application architecture to embrace applications on modern endpoints which would be your iPhone, your iPad, Android devices, and emerging IoT. So how do you get those devices to communicate securely to your back-end infrastructure without messing with your back-end infrastructure? Because nobody is doing that in public or private sector. And the best way to do that is to, in, uh, to put in place an API gateway. If you look at all the analysts, that's basically what they're suggesting. It's the best way to do protocol transformation to allow a modern endpoint like an iPhone or an Android device, to talk to a back-end system that has no clue what an iPhone or an Android device is. It does all the protocol transformation. It does all the orchestration. An API gateway should also be handling traffic management, making sure that there's the, um, if there's a large influx of in input coming in at a certain time, that it can kind of parse that out, or maybe even uh, load up or do load balancing, load up another uh, gateway, um, have redundancy for failure, that kind of thing. But more importantly, security. An API gateway should tie into the existing PAM and IAM systems 
seamlessly so that only the right user with the right application can get access to sensitive information on the back end. So this is one of the cruxes of API management in general. There are companies out there that basically do APIs and they figure I don't need any kind of gateway in front of my application back end infrastructure. I'll just make it a private API. You can do that and the bad guys will love you for it because they're looking for things like that. You need a hardened solution in place and for you guys, you know, what does hardened mean for an API gateway? For you guys, it's really simple. Is it common criteria certified? Yes or no? Boom, done. So put in your, your hardened security, let it do the work of making sure that only the guys or the good people on the right application um, with the right credentials can get in. Come on. So I'm gonna give you a real world example here though of where there's a failure with that. So I've established I'm the right user and I'm on the right application to get into um, my agency. That's, that's a great scenario to, to protect your data, but I'm gonna give you an, a real world scenario. I'm uh, with my spouse, I wanna go out to dinner, I pull up Yelp, I Google Great Steakhouse DC, comes up with Maestro's, Maestro's on 13th. So I figure, great, let's go out to dinner. So we go out, and while I'm there, I realize I didn't check off on a top secret document that I needed to look at. And, and basically give a check. So I use biometrics to log into my mobile device, right? I then use some form of MFA to log into my application that allows me access to my share site at my agency. I'm now definitely logged in. And as soon as I do that, in walks the deputy assistant secretary or somebody like that and recognizes me, comes over, says hi, so what do I do? I put the phone down on the table, shake hands, talk for a minute, and while I've done that, your friendly neighborhood Boris has calmly walked by, picked up the phone, and just kept on going. Now here is the problem that you face in that situation. Your phone knows absolutely it's you. The application knows absolutely it's you. This is one of those rare times in the world, or in your life, where you are not you. Boris is you. And Boris has full access to everything that you have rights to. So this is where we're gonna go from the back end and approach the front end a little bit by integrating an SDK into your applications that allow you to basically establish AI that says the right user on the right device with the right application, let's monitor that relationship. And if I see somebody who basically occasionally opens up a top secret file on his iPhone or iPad, all of a sudden downloading every single top secret file that he has available, that's a flag. So let's do a step up off to that advanced or that threat analytics engine and basically stop the app until that step up off is completed. That's the value of an SDK. So your agency has developers somewhere that are building APIs and providing SDKs to your developers and how do, they, how do your developers find out what those APIs are and how they work? They basically go through a developer portal, an API portal. That basically does a couple of things. It says, here's the APIs that you're allowed access to. Here's how they operate. Here's when you would use them. Here's why you would use them. And if it's the right kind of API developer portal, it'll also then say, what language do you use? Python, Ruby, C, whatever click a button and it generates the code to actually copy and paste into your application for that developer to use. Developers, I used to be a developer for a very long time. We're inherently lazy. We don't like to develop code we don't have to develop. So having that copy and paste is a beautiful thing. And a lot of API uh, portals do that for you. So API portals do a few other things. So from a business ops perspective, I can now take a look at um, managing my developers and who they are, what, uh, contracting the agencies they're with, what APIs they should have access to, and expose those APIs to developers so that those developers can easily integrate them into their apps. From an ops perspective, I can see what APIs are actually being utilized, 
how they're being utilized, and if they're effective or not. And then finally, from a business perspective, if I figured out a way to monetize those APIs, I can actually do so inside of the API portal. The end, at the end of the day, an API portal basically allows you to enable developer velocity that, you're needed, that is absolutely needed for your agency. And I'm gonna leave this with one um, place where velocity is absolutely killer with an API portal with a gateway. I mentioned developers are inherently lazy. We're, we really, all we wanna do is build killer applications that you love, and especially in the mobile world. It's all about making a great customer experience or employee experience. If you don't like the application, what do you do with it? You delete it, right? Developers don't like that. They like their applications being used. Developers also, I don't care public sector, private sector, where you are in the world, you hate security if you're a developer with a passion. So what if I, as an API owner, the guy building APIs, can build a single API, and I'm gonna be lazy, because I'm a developer, and call it a security API, so that's its name. So Mr. Developer, use this API, it's mandated by the way, you have to use it. Here's how you use it, here's the co copy and paste this code into your application to use it. And in doing so, what I've just done is enforced SSL, I've enforced single sign-on, I've enforced use FIPS 140-2 or .2, I've enforced virtually every aspect of security that that developer does not want to deal with. And I've done it all through one API call. That's the kind of velocity that you really want to see um, when you're in, or installing an API gateway and portal. Thank you. Am I back on? Okay, yeah. So <clears throat> we started this discussion with data and um, Let's talk a little bit about our portfolio. So it, it should come as no surprise. We've kind of laid this, the groundwork. We showed you the blueprint of how everything works together. But um, you know, we call PAM the foundational layer because it's the closest to the data. And it also provides the most amount of security for privileged users. Um, Threat analytics is kind of the, uh, the, the automation and analytics layer that goes above that. Um, IEM is the next layer, and again, this is probably existing in most organizations, but it ties into very nicely and complements PAM and Threat Analytics. Um, strong authentication is something that we put above IEM because uh, you know, it's usually that's the last layer, with at least for the browser users, um, that we're in, uh, engaging with them. And then finally, API management. Um, so you can see how, why we came up with the, the idea of inside out. We've started with the inside and we've moved outwards. Um, we have another portfolio called payment security that you guys may have heard of, but um, it's a very unique uh, offering and it's not really, I would say, necessarily applicable to most agencies. So we didn't, we didn't include it in this, this presentation, but we're more than welcome to talk about that if anyone wants to hear more about that one. Bill and I will be around for the rest of the afternoon at the table if you have any other questions about, about uh, any of the products. I'm sure there's quite a few of you that are uh, existing security customers. So if you have any questions about existing products, certainly stop by and talk to us. So, if you have any, we have about two minutes if anybody has any questions now. Okay, then I guess you get two minutes back. Thank you very much. See